So the disclosures are in the handout. Um, so the, the sequence of IBD cancer prevention formula is well recognized to the group here. Accurate risk identification, detection of precancer, prevention strategies, and the outcome of interest is to decrease the risk of cancer, mortality, colectomy while increasing health-related quality of life. And we like to intervene at an earlier stage prior to the de development of cancer. Years ago, we started doing random biopsies based on uh, the limitations of technology at the time. Dysplasia was thought to be, quote, invisible at the time. There was a concept of a field defect in the uh, colon. It was the old needle in the haystack phenomenon, if you would. And retrospective assessment of predictive value of dysplasia, we treated all dysplasia as equal. And the best guess approach to systematic sampling of the mucosa was the premise that we went by at that point in time. But obviously we've evolved, and thank goodness we've evolved, and we're doing less surgery at this point in time in an appropriate fashion. We have an understanding of the natural history of dysplasia. We have improvement in high definition colonoscopic detection. The bowel preparations are better. Random biopsies are low yield, but at this point I don't know if we should abandon these, and these are an area of debate that will continue to go on. And white light colonoscopy in modern technology does identify most dysplasia. Some of the three initial studies showed us that uh, invisible, indistinguishable from the surrounding inflamed or quiescent mucosa was not the standard, but it's more visible. Polypoid dysplasia, we looked for irregular borders, spreading lesions, not endoscopically receptible, DOM-like lesions as we termed them at the time, masses are strictured, and a good sensitivity per lesion and per patient sensitivity based on some of the initial studies that were published. So it's usually visible. We've now improved. We have image-enhanced endoscopy techniques, and there are dye-based techniques, and I'll talk about two in particular, indigo carmine and methylene blue. In Japan, Cressel violet is done routinely, and it's not something we've embraced in the United States as of yet. And I'm sure that any food dye of sorts you could apply to the colon of adequate concentration and perhaps get a similar effect. And then we have a host of other things, narrowband imaging, laser, um, the blue light imaging, the FICE, and the eye scan optical enhancement. These are things that are in evolution and undergoing testing. So the potential factors that influence the visibility of dysplasia are several fold. You get older, you can't see as well, your vision is less, and I adapted this slide courtesy of Tom. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to use this. Um, the monitor resolution, the distance to the monitor, the visual acuity of the individual, the experience of the endoscopist, the time spent on withdrawal, and we've not yet established, quote, standards for IBD for withdrawal time, the biology of the lesion and the scope resolution, as well the quality of the prep. All of these play a role when we look at this directly. And the biology of the lesion and special stains is really what I'm going to focus on. If we look at endoscopic specific factors, endoscopic recognition of dysplasia, adequacy of the sampling, the interfering anatomy, do you have pseudopolyps, do you have strictures, and what do you identify as abnormal in that? Do you have resectability and completeness of resection? And the patients have to comply with things. So chromoendoscopy, I think we would all say, identifies more dysplastic lesions. There's a question as to whether they're clinically meaningful in most patients. Uh, and the studies are of per lesion sensitivity and yield. Specificity is not well defined, and there's clear limitations when we look at this. The prior nomenclature we've had was sporadic adenoma, a DOM lesion, adenoma-like DOM lesion or non-adenoma-like, flat dysplasia, is it visible or is it invisible, and most dysplasia was believed to be visible. There's been a recent uh, discussion that we had earlier yesterday in the scenic consensus, if you would, classification for IBD colorectal neoplasia, suggesting 90% of visible dysplasia is, or dysplasia is visible and 10% is invisible, and we have definitions of such. Polypoid or non-polypoid? Is it sessile or pedunculated? In the non-polypoid, is it slightly elevated, flat, or depressed? And the descriptors, is there a distinct border? Is it circumscribed? Is it ulcerated? And these should be in our endoscopic classification of these lesions directly. Or is it indistinct, not to streak and can't be distinguished? 
from the surrounding mucosa. So these are the things that we think of when looking at such. There's certain recommendations we need, a clean prep. And the problem often we encounter is no inflammation should be present when we do chromo directly. The dyes, indigo carmine or methylene blue, you can use a spray catheter, or if you have a power wash with your endoscopic equipment, this can be done, and I'll show how it's done very simply. A colonoscope, obviously. You need some time and experience endoscopists, and sometimes antispasmodic agents are used. There is limitations. There's no measures of improved outcomes, decreased cancer, colectomy, quality of life or mortality in doing this as of yet. There's no uniform approach. Methylene blue or indigo carmine, there's no standardization. Do we look at macroscopic or microscopic lesions? And which prep is the best to do this? We know that the majority of patients in clinical remission have active mucosal inflammation, and this is one of many studies that have shown us that a large percentage of patients have endoscopically visible and microscopically present inflammation in the presence of individuals directly. So how do you do it? The luminal surface is usually cleaned with water or a mucolytic agent such as N-acetylcysteine, and a large amount of stool precludes you from doing and staining the mucosal visualization. You can use it either pancolonically or localized. And pancolonic is usually informed or done to increase the dysplasia detection rate or adenomatous, and a targeted dye spraying is used to delineate the margins of lesions. and I'll show you examples of each from non-neoplastic or neoplastic. Three kinds of stains, and we use the absorptive and the contrast. The reactive is less used, if you would, and the most commonly used we talked about, indigo, carmine, and methylene blue. So there's other absorptive stains. Lugol's iodine is used for gynecologic aspects, toluidine blue, cresyl violet. These are the most commonly used for other applications. So the absorptive type is interesting because it's sprayed on and it's absorbed by the mucosa of the small intestine and the colonic epithelium. The premise is that it's poorly absorbed by damaged mucosa or non-absorptive surfaces like squamous epithelium, active inflammation, and neoplasia. So that's the premise that you're looking at. The level of absorption correlates with the amount of cytoplasma and goblet cells that are present. So the N-acetylcysteine can be used to get rid of the mucus layer if you're not getting a good washing with the water because if the mucus is present, it will not allow the methylene blue to absorb into the mucosa. So a suggested algorithm is give a PEG solution or another solution directly to clean the colon. Mucosa is washed with water. You may use a mucrolytic. 10 to 20% is a standard that's been used for those that use this. Um, and then you wash the mucolytic off, and then the dye is sprayed on. The excessive dye is taken off after two minutes. It takes about two minutes for methylene blue to effectively be involved. And how do you do it? Well, you take a vial, two vials, 10 mLs each, or 1%. It's 10 milligrams per mL, 200 milligrams total. Add it to 500 cc's of sterile water and shake it. So it's a 0.4% solution. And this is connected in my unit to the water pump. And there's a company I listed so people know if they don't do it where they can get it. This is where we get our supply by Acorn in Lake Forest, Illinois, whatever that is. I don't know, but our suppliers do that. Um, so the chromo endoscopy, and there's others, I'm sure. Chromo endoscopy technique. You spray the water on, the dye is sprayed, too much uh, of this, this is the indigo carmine as opposed to the methylene blue. Too much dye requires to wash with water, and a fine spray allows optimal pooling and visualization, and the pooled dye is washed away. And then I'll show you in a video shortly. And because it's not absorbed, the pooling goes into the grooves and the crevices of the colon, um, and it allows better definition of the colonic borders of the areas or the neoplasm. Indigo carmine is used for colonic staining. It's not available commercially at this point in time though you can get non-patient grade of online, but we don't use it because it's not uh, approved. And you apply it in a spray catheter or water jet in the same way. So with the uh, indigo carmine, you prep the colon, two grams of indigo carmine we add to a liter of normal saline, so it's a 0.2%, and it can range anywhere from 0.008% to 0.1%. 
to 0.4% of the studies in the literature, and then you connect it to the water pump. And indigo carmine comes at eight milligram per ml vials, or eight milligram per ml, and there are five milligram millil vials, and you can get that from several companies that I've listed again, in case you want to do that. So this is um, how you might do it. So two amps and 250 cc's of water for detection. If you want detailed viewing, in other words, you can use different concentrations of the indigo carmine. If you want to define in general, you can spray on with a less concentrated solution initially, and then go back, have a more concentrated solution, is often what I'll do, to better delineate the lesions, once you detect the lesions, if you want to see. And you could use submucosal injection as well, if you have a polypoid lesion you want to delineate, um, just as we often do with methylene blue. So we'll start the video here, and this is sort of mixing it technically here. Can we get the volume up? I guess there's no volume, so I'll be the volume. Um, so basically what you do is you have the methylene blue, wow, don't shoot me. <laughs> you have the methylene blue in the uh, vial, and then you withdraw with a syringe, or you can take off the cap of the vial, and that's a 500 uh, cc sterile water container. And then what you do is to, general shortcuts, no, there's no shortcuts, you have to do this. Um, <laughs> you, you, they're not pre-processed because it's not stable if you mix it for a while. And then you just put it in and you take your two vials and then once the uh, vials are there, you then go ahead and you mix it up. And remember, you're not going to put the methylene blue or the indigo carmine into the colon until you're in the cecum. It's when you're in the cecum and you've cleaned up the colon on the way in that you're going to start to spray things. So let's see if it works here. Can you please uh, click? Thank you. Well, we have no volume. So um, what you do is then you shake up the volume, you connect it very easily to the water jet itself, and as it's connected to the water jet, um, you then uh, shake it up to make sure it's concentrated and always wear a gown and gloves because this will stain and will not come off readily. And uh, often have your assistant do it. You don't want to do this if you can avoid it. <laughs> okay, so then that's connected and then you'll go in and this is on your way out, you do this. So you spray the indigo carmine after reaching the cecum, you apply it to the side opposite gravity in general, so it then coats the bowel. Use a minimum volume, uh, essentially, to clean all walls of the colon and remove the mucus, and then you can add cymethicone. We often add cymethicone to it in an effort to get rid of the bile and the bubbles. It makes it a lot easier. And then this is a classic example we had of someone who's before and after the indigo carmine. You can see just a light spray on there. Very hard to see this lesion, it's very readily visible. Um, and we'll show you here as well. Some of the things you want to do. This is active disease. This is not an appropriate candidate to consider chromoendoscopy in. This will not take up well. It's not something you can see. Now you can do segmental in the bowel, where if there's active disease in one area, then you can do it in an area where there's not necessarily active disease. But this is where you want to take many biopsies in the area and not necessarily do targeted lesions if you're in a believer with targeted lesions because it will not be easy to, uh, you know, directly do so. And this is an area an excellent bowel prep is important, so you really want to go in and clean the bowel completely, use your water jet, uh, clean it very well. And you can see here after cleaning up a large serrated adenoma that I took out in a patient uh, that had IBD uh, with piecemeal fashion and uh, we then uh, marked it, tattooed the area, uh, thinking this is something that was uh, in an area that was not active IBD, but it was adjacent to the area of the active IBD. The other thing that's important then is to start the spray. And this is me doing chromoendoscopy here, going into the cecum and withdrawing and just spraying all over. This is methylene blue. So you just want to spray it all over the place. Uh, let it sit for a couple of minutes. And I usually do the cecum, the ascending colon, then go back in. Then I'll do the transverse colon and go back, um, and then the uh, left colon and go back. And it adds about an extra 10 minutes of time uh, if you're doing things. It's really not a lot of time per se. Um, and then you can see how it fills up areas and you can see very readily. 
you know, what's going on. It's, it's simple to do. It's not very hard. It's the recognition. And I'll show you some examples of areas of uh, abnormalities. The things you also have to remember is tell the patients. The staining can last up to 24 hours, and they may have discolored stools and undergarments. Um, also, because it's an absorptive dimethylene blue, you may get green urine. So this is something that comes about. There's a rare case or two of anaphylaxis, so it's something to tell them. And there's in vitro study that suggests that white light methylene blue can cause single-stranded DNA breaks. This was suggested years ago in the journal Gut, uh, but that's not something that is perceived to be clinically important uh, in clinical practice, but it's something I disclose to the patients directly. So the indigo carmine coats the mucosa, the uh, methylene blue is poorly stained active inflammation and dysplasia. How do you describe lesions? Well, the, the uh, scenic group had suggested using the Paris classification, and I think it's a user-friendly way. And this is the Paris classification. It's either polypoid or non-polypoid, as you can see here. And then you have 1P, 1S, they're either pedunculated or sessile, and then 2A is slightly elevated, can we go back, please? Back, please, one slide. And uh, this is flat, and that's depressed, so 2C. And these are very simple ways to describe lesions. Um, if we look at this, we can see the borders of this are going to be easier to see. Whoops, can we? And you really think the border is right about here and here. But as you move on, and if we could go to the end of this video directly, we'll show you the borders. You'll see how much you really cannot see. Um, so all the way to the end, just slide it across if you could on the video. Right there, you can see how the borders are all the way, all the way out to here. And it's a large, large lesion that wasn't detectable. Very simple to see it once you apply the chromo on top of things. It's really making it readily visible. And here's some other lesions that were uh, <clears throat> not easy to detect. You sort of see it coming back, and you'll see it come into view right there. That's your lesion. Not, not easy to always detect, but then we'll show you. We'll do a little chromo spray on it. It's a Paris 2C lesion. See how easy it is to detect with the chromo? Much easier, and then to... Uh, open up the, uh, the bowel completely. So uh, I think the current practice is to use pancolonic dye spray targeted biopsies. 0.2% is commonly used. Random biopsy, many physicians still do. Others are avoiding that, uh, thinking this may be time-saving. It has yet to be put to a randomized test uh, as of yet. The equipment has made it better and easier to detect to detect things. There's no CPT code for the procedure. A 22 modifier can be used. 43, 4, 9, 9, and 59 modifier indicate chromoendoscopies, but that'll be denied most of the time. So these are things that, uh, unfortunately, that's not there yet. Uh, if we look at some of the larger uh, places, the blues as of April 2013 was the earliest I could, latest I could see, quote, chromoendoscopy and virtual chromoendoscopy as an adjunct to diagnostic or surveillance colonoscopy is considered incidental to the colonoscopy and therefore not separately reimbursed. Um, and I think what we need are longitudinal studies, agreement of endpoints worth achieving, dysplasia yield, cancers, cancer mortality, cost, intervals between colonoscopies are important to determine. And I think all patients with ulcerative colitis and Crohn's should have surveillance after 8 to 10 years uh, directly. Um, and these were courtesy of Frank had given me these slides. Um, uh, undergo surveillance and stage of extent um, directly and increased risk of neoplasia should be looked for. Left-sided or extensive disease and Crohn's when you get more than a third of the colon. Um, when the highest risk is there, consider annual surveillance every one to three years or every two to five if it's lower risk. And the British Society suggests every five years to do so. And dye-based chromoendoscopy with targeted biopsies maximizes the neoplasia detection. But which group should have this is still not yet agreed upon with consensus. So use random biopsies as alternative to dye based or in patients with poor preps and multiple pseudopolyps and endoscopically visually visualized lesions that are circumscribed. They're amendable to endoscopic resection with no evidence of dysplasia in the surrounding flat mucosa. 
These are the ones to continue to take out the lesions and continue surveillance. So hopefully this has given you at least an insight as to how to do chromoendoscopy. It's rather simple, it's not technically hard, but it's really recognizing what you find that's the best thing that's important to look at. Thank you much.